Okay, so now for one of those remarkable Irish women that Bridges Festival is all about. Emer O'Toole is an Associate Professor of Irish Performance Studies at Concordia University in Montreal here in Canada. She's also a theatre maker and an author. Her book, Girls Will Be Girls, deals with gender and performance, while her academic work is focused on activist theatre here in Ireland. Emer contributes to many, many publications, so you might recognise her name from The Guardian, The Irish Times or The Independent, where she provides contributions on issues relating to feminism and to Ireland. Um, importantly for today, Emer is a massive fan of Bridget, whether in goddess or in saint form. So without any more further chatter from me, I'd like to introduce Dr. Emer O'Toole. Hi. On the 31st of January 1984, 15-year-old Anne Lovett left school to lie beneath the statue of the Virgin Mary in a grotto above her, her border town. Is Mary your mother? My mother's Mary. Half my friends from home have a mother called Mary and the rest have at least one Mary for a granny. Mary, the mother of us all. Mary, my mother, was over six months pregnant when Anne Lovett pushed her baby out into winter. Mary was molding me from the stuff of her flesh as Anne bled to ascension. Anne would be in her early fifties now, still young, done with bleeding maybe, Certainly done with the years when her body could be wrest from her and declared a holy vessel. Out of danger. What would she be up to if her small town, her small nation, had not condemned her to die at the feet of an impossible ideal? Virgin and mother, mother and virgin. Would she be dreaming of a week in the sun? I wish Anne Lovett were over 50, a little overweight. One of those women with, women with a fuck is all loyalty to smoking. Shopping online for a swimsuit for Lanzarote. I wish Mary had helped her. The mother of God was tired, maybe. The year 1983 had been a big one. Invoked endlessly in the campaign to introduce a pro-life amendment to the Irish constitution. Standing for hours on end as a symbol of the only appropriate reason for and response to a crisis pregnancy being marched up and down in front of Ireland's family planning clinics in protest of the wanton distribution of lately legal, but only with the prescription prophylactics. She'd had a lot on. Besides, she was gearing up for her 1985 moving statue tour with plans to appear at over 30 locations around the country. If the statue at Grenard refused to move that January day, the poet Paula Meehan makes her speak. And though she cried out to me in extremis, I did not move. I didn't lift a finger to help her. I didn't intercede with heaven, nor whisper the charmed word in God's ear. Didn't, not couldn't, why? My mother, Mary, you remember, worked as a nurse for the Galway Family Planning Clinic in 1984. She still tells funny stories of the Legion of Mary parading up and down outside the premises, holding a weighty effigy of the Virgin, chanting the rosary, keeping their beady eyes out for sinners to shame. Customers would nip in as the procession passed the doorway and then wait for it to pass back again before running off in the opposite direction with their spermicidal spoils. Larks. Ivan Boland says of the voice of Meehan's Mary, she turns the reader into a wee into a historical community, a receptive register for worn out loyalties and disturbed religious feeling. God, who wants to be a receptive register for worn out loyalties and disturbed religious feeling? No, you're a receptive register for worn out loyalties and disturbed religious feeling, Mary. I never asked to be born. The year 1984 gestated and Mary stopped going to work because it was time to have me. On April 14th, at University College Hospital Galway, at 10 past eight in the morning, I arrived one week early. I continued to be a zealously punctual morning person. Mum says that a doctor took a picture of me as an example of a baby with perfect fat distribution. This characteristic, sadly, I failed to maintain. On the same day, Another baby was breaking the waters. A, pl 
plastic bag washed up on the shore at Cahirsifin Strand, County Kerry. In it, there was a newborn who had been stabbed 28 times. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. This is upsetting to recite. To recite it is upsetting. 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 25, 26, 27, 28. Sweet Holy Mother of Mercy. It was known that a local woman, Joanne Hayes, had been pregnant. I am always fascinated by the it was known in this story, how Hayes' pregnancy was seen and unseen, how no questions were asked until there was a corpse. Hayes and her family were interrogated and by their accounts intimidated until they confessed to the murder of the Cahar Sabine baby, a murder which they did not commit. Afterwards, they produced another tiny body, Hayes' own child, buried in secret on the family farm. Hayes says her son died shortly after birth. How many Irish mammies does it take to change a light bulb? None. I'll be fine here on my own in the dark. The Gardaí, not to be deprived of what Nell McCafferty designates a woman to blame, ludicrously accused Hayes of conceiving twins by two separate fathers, stabbing one and throwing it at birth. Variety is the spice, I guess. April 1984, a cruel month. So soon after the Irish electorate wrapped the noose of the Eighth Amendment around the Republic's womb, bodies started to push up through the earth like shoots refusing to stay quiet in Kalini, refusing to be hidden within which James A. Smith calls Ireland's architecture of containment, the Magdalene laundries and mother and baby homes designed to catch the ideological overspill of De Valera's dewy green dreams. Marco Harkin's film Hush a by Baby from 1990 is perhaps the most encompassing cultural text to address this moment in Irish history. In it, Dairy teenager Goretti Friel hides a pregnancy against the backdrop of 1980s British army occupation, of community devotion to the Blessed Virgin and Irish nationalism, of enforced ignorance about reproduction, and of a performance of modern sexual liberation influenced by cultural imports from the USA. Distressed and unable to confide in anyone, Goretti takes what is surely the most well-trodden journey in Irish cinema. She goes west. In the Donegal Gaeltacht, she cries on a stony grey beach, trapped by her island, a blue plastic bag reminiscent of Cahir Sabine washing against the shore. Or, baking bread in an idyllic cottage kitchen, she waits for the ban and chi to leave before she tunes the radio to an English language station and listens to two Dublin voices debating abortion and the death of Anne Lovett. When the ban and chi returns, Goretti adjusts the dial to listen to traditional music and the Irish language once more. From all directions, her history, her culture and her country close in on her. One of the few moments of respite comes when she and her friend Dinky stop at a grotto to the Virgin and pray. Lovely, isn't it? Says Goretti. Lovely, isn't it? As long as it doesn't move, it is. Do you really think they do move? I don't know. I don't think any of moving Donegal or anywhere in the north either, for that matter. So we're safe. Same. I'd be afraid to pass here in a dark night. <laughs> <laughs> 
seeing you in a dark night would be enough to make her move. <laughs> God forgive you and pardon you, Grady. You heathen ye. <laughs> Girl, can't you look at her? I'll shop you to the vanity. We have two guests in the studio with us today, and we'll be returning to the very sensitive and controversial subject of abortion. It's almost a year now since the country voted by referendum to make abortion illegal under the Constitution. Today we'll try to examine the effects of that legislation and look generally at the prevailing attitudes to the Come with your way. She didn't shoot it. human life. Abortion cannot be described as anything other than murder. Bishop Cassidy was quite correct when he stated before the referendum that at the time the most dangerous place to be was in the mother's womb. I'm sure poor Anne Lovett had the benefit of that wisdom when she lay dying in a field at Granard, 15 years of age, and at a grotto of the Virgin Mary as well. Abortion as an option hasn't disappeared overnight in Ireland because of this referendum. The vote to outlaw it within the Irish Constitution only increased the fear and isolation that thousands of Irish women. The law is grossly hypocritical. Women are still taking Indebted to international feminist avant-garde film, Hush It By Baby gradually muddies the visual distinction between Goretti and the Virgin. Feverish dreams confuse her pregnant body with Marian statues until on Christmas day, she goes into a nightmarish labor. Scholar Fidelma Farley astutely locates the film's contribution to Irish national discourse in its demonstration of an awareness of the pull and attraction of the fantasy maternal for women at the same time as it deconstructs the myths that underpin that fantasy. Mary, after all, is an unmarried teenage mother too. A small devotional figure looks on as desperate Goretti tries to self-abort using castor oil gin and a scalding bath. Could the Virgin be protecting her? As tempting as the cool simplicity of a scathing athe atheism often feels to me, I understand what Farley calls the pull and attraction of the fantasy maternal. Embarrassing fact. I had a May altar in my room every year when I was little. This was encouraged by my mum, who was perhaps trying to ensure that at least one Mary got the respect she deserved about the place. The altar was a cardboard box with a scarf over it, staged to a plastic virgin, worshipped by wildflowers and jam jars. My friend from down the road still slags me about this mercilessly. It was nice to have a girl god, though. No, you're a receptive register for worn out loyalties and disturbed religious feeling. I wonder if this pull and attraction might ripple with something deeper. Diana Taylor writes of the cult of the Virgin in Latin America. She cites the 16th century Franciscan friar, Bernardini de Satagoon whose letters gripe that the idolatrous neighbor, natives are still performing their diabolical pil pilgrimages and sacrifices, but under a Christian guise. 
the good friar complains of a hill where a temple to Tontanzan, mother of the gods, once stood, he says. And now that the church of Our Lady of Guadalupe was built there, they also call it Tontanzan. And they come now to visit this Tontanzan from far off, as far off as before, which devotion is also suspicious because everywhere there are many churches of Our Lady and they do not go to them. But Our Lady of Guadalupe chose precisely this hill to appear to a recent Christian convert, Juan Diego, in 1531. This is the thing with Mary. She never seems to want to appear on the steps of St. Peter's Basilica. She likes a heathen shrine, a west of Ireland village. Taylor thinks about what it means when one deity is worshipped, quote, not only under the guise of another, but also at the same time as another, a form of multiplication and simultaneity rather than surrogation and absenting. She talks about how performances like those underpinning the cult of the Virgin of Guadalupe outlast the memory of their meanings. People end up repeating behaviors they have long since ceased to understand. Indulge me then as I imagine that all this Irish devotion to a girl god is rooted far underground, with the good people maybe, with Bridget, daughter of the Dagda, who even when Christianized, brewed beer and performed abortions. The Tuha de Dana, Ireland's pre-Christian Parthenon, translates as the people of Dana, a goddess who is mother of them all. Dana's daughters could kill with only their words, shapeshift, prophesize, outrun the fastest horses and curse the men who mistreated them in pregnancy down through the generations. Sure, they could do all kinds of everything. You can stop indulging me now if you like. I am probably just trying to make the conflicted conclusion of a childhood and adolescence in which every holiday, every milestone on the road to the age of reason was drenched in priests and incense. Just a little bit more interesting. 1992 brought the X case in which a Supreme Court judge ruled that a pregnant and suicidal teenage rape victim had the right to an abortion. I was seven years old. Miss X was only seven years older. In the aftermath, the government put three referendums to the Irish people, asking them, first, to remove the grounds of suicide for legal abortion, second, whether pregnant women and girls should have the right to travel for terminations, and third, whether they should have the right to access information about abortion. The electorate took a pro-choice stance on each of these issues. The government, however, did not legislate. I remember picking roadside flowers with my granny in Carrow for the grotto tucked into the trees beside her cottage. With the dozens of other grand spawn for competition, having my witty, elegant grandmother to myself was a rare treat. When I was older, she would tell me, if they'd had the pill in my day, there'd certainly be a few less O'Tools. She wasn't a Mary. She was an Anne, Nancy. In 2002, the government tried once again to have the people remove suicide as grounds for illegal abortion. The people refused, by a hair's breadth this time. In 2002, I was turning 18, but ineligible to vote by one month. Probably a good thing. I had, after all, just spent most of my life being propagandized at Catholic school. I might even have voted to remove suicide as a ground for abortion in spite of my own pregnancy scare. At 16, I started having truly terrible sex and thus played a clandestine visit to a sympathetic doctor for the pill. I was told to wait until the first day of my period to start the prescription, but my period didn't come. For weeks, I ran to the toilets between classes to check for blood. Buying a pregnancy test at the pharmacy in my village was inconceivable, obviously. I managed to get into Galway City and bought one in booths on Shop Street. I'll never forget the look the woman behind the counter gave me. The Legion of Mary might not have been out marching, but it was alive and well. I took the test on a Sunday in a public bathroom after my dance class. I was so relieved it was negative that I didn't worry about the fact I'd become so thin my periods had stopped. You don't look pregnant. Are you sure you don't have cancer or something? Says Goretti's best friend, Dinky. I wish to God I had cancer, replies Goretti, not missing a beat. A crisis pregnancy does not need to be worse than anorexia, worse than cancer. 
In Anya Phillips' landmark performance art piece, Sex, Birth and Death from 2003, she positions abortion as a point in a cycle of female sexuality, reproduction, nurturance, and even pleasure. Milk pumps from her maternal teats. A traditional Irish fruitcake in the shape of a fetus lies in a kidney dish. Phillips chops it up and relishes a slice, offers some to her audience, invites us to chow down on a feminine ideal that tells us we shouldn't fuck or eat. A crisis pregnancy can be truly unterrible. But it was terrible for, are you ready for the oppression alphabet? Miss X, Miss C, Miss D, Miss A, Miss B, Miss C. Yes, there were two Miss C's or Ms. Y. Don't be fooled into thinking the progressive change of honorific represents a progressive change of anything else nor for Amanda Mellet or Siobhan Whelan, nor for the family of the brain dead woman kept alive as a slowly decomposing cadaveric incubator for an inviolable fetus, nor for the 10 a day who traveled to the UK, nor for all the girls and women who used abortion pills illegally and without medical support. Crisis pregnancy was made as terrible as possible, intentionally, because women were supposed to suffer for their sexuality. Mother and baby home survivor Anne O'Gorman tells of giving birth terrified at Besborough. She was 17. The nun in attendance taunted her. You weren't roaring and shouting like that when you were having sex, were you? Anne passed out from the pain of having the afterbirth roughly removed. When she awoke three days later, her daughter, Evelyn, was gone. The last of those hells might have shut in 1998, but still, you couldn't have women getting off scot-free. So we were off to London for a fun weekend. We had a bit of a flu actually, and we couldn't come in. Even miscarriages had to be made as terrible as possible. And at University College Hospital Galway, in October of 2012, Savita Halapanavers was made the most terrible of all. And though she cried out to me in extremis, I did not move. I didn't lift a finger to help her. I didn't intercede with heaven nor whisper the charmed word in God's ear. Didn't, not, couldn't. Why? A midwife told Savita the truth, that she couldn't have an abortion because she was in a Catholic country. And in the days that followed, the truth teller was sent out into the wilderness bearing the sins of her people. Sure, everyone else was just repeating devotions they had long since ceased to understand. Through his grief, Savita's husband Pravin said that maybe Savita was born to change Ireland's laws. Her face appeared on gable walls. She looked down at us from lampposts. Shrines to her sp sprung up under bridges, in back alleys. Her name was carved on bathroom doors and university desks and anywhere the wood was soft enough to bear it. Who could miss in a Catholic country that Savita had died for her sins? What would she be up to if she hadn't been condemned to die on the bed of an impenetrable precedent, virgin and mother, mother and virgin? Would she be giving out to a toddler who has peed on the carpet and is trying to blame the cat while a seven-year-old and a five-year-old scale the living room sofa? I wish Savita was stuck in a 5 p.m. Galway bot bottleneck late to get her kids from the childminder again, cursing the lady in the green master who's beatifically letting everyone out of the Merchants Road car park. Looking for seeing three small faces with smiles just like her the kind of smiles that slit through apathy like a scalpel. I wish I'd never heard of her. We lit candles and chanted her name. We sent up our sighs, mourning and weeping. Savita, our life, our sweetness and our hope. And her faithful started to testify to what they too had endured. Comedian Tara Flynn sung her abortion story in a gentle, moving one person show not a funny word. It's a piece that, like Philip's fetus cake, proclaims its right to be pleasurable. Flynn takes the stage and announces, hello everyone, I'm Tara and I'm a filthy slut, before launching into a number on shame. Irish women are saints if they're your mother. Whores are virgins 
one or the other. Fortune, fortune, Kate, meal of fortune, 100,000 ways to fortune. Flynn brings us on the journey that so many Irish women have taken overseas to an abortion clinic, then back to a country that considers them criminals. But she refuses to stay mired in what she designates the state of our shame. And the piece ends with a silly cathartic song on, well, riding. Flynn sings, let's ride our way to freedom. It's a virtue, not a vice. Whips and chains might be a pain, but if you like them, do it twice. Give them shocks in the confession box. Give them more than swearing. By the by, these hips don't lie, though they are not childbearing. Ride for Ireland, take your turn at the top. Ride for Ireland, don't ever stop. Ride for Ireland, might as well in this weather. Ride for Ireland, and maybe we will come together. The day of the referendum, I walked down Shop Street and stopped to talk to campaigners on either side of the chasm. A young woman out for no had an American accent. She explained she was studying in Galway for the year, then shared her well-polished arguments with me. I thanked her, moved on. Three meters down the street, I swear upon my soul before you now that she manifested again once more from the crowd. An apparition. Disbelieving, I looked back, forward, back, forward, back, twins, blessed American virgins. I envied them their loyalties, their undisturbed religious feeling. It was time to pray. Hail Mary of grace. Is the Lord with thee? No, he's out. Could I, could I have a word? I'm not doubting the whole Gabriel story. As a feminist, I believe women. But you and Joseph, you got down, right? In fairness, that beard is hot. To thee do we cry, poor banished daughters of Eve. We're sick of fairies and flights. We don't want to be Miss C. Mary, O oh most gracious mother of us all, we know you're on our side. Enter fucking seed, girl. Now the powers that be informed us we shouldn't celebrate, but me and my mother Mary popped a bottle of Prosecco all the same. Sure, who would begrudge us our pleasures? In further contravention of our moral overlords, the night we won, I went out dancing in the sweaty basement of the Blackgate Bar, where the DJ, my witty, elegant cousin, played only tunes by chicks. She was there, the virgin, cavorting in her child sky robes till dawn, with her homemade placards stashed in the corner, rosaries, ovaries, loose, incarnate. Of course she was there. On Christmas Day of 2018, the year we repealed the Eighth Amendment to the Irish Constitution, I peed on a stick in my partner's parents' bathroom, and it was revealed that onto me, a man and or woman child would be born. And how much sweeter is a dream that's no one's nightmare. After, after 35 years of the eighth, after Anne, after Savita, the Virgin Mother is a mess, just like the rest of us. Our feeling for her might do most good when disturbed. Of Meehan's poem, Boland writes, the voice of the Virgin addresses a lost unity but even in the moment of loss, what is shared is remembered, what is lost is recognized. Unity is beautiful, it is. Then it comes to weigh heavy. The rupture is painful, trust me, I know, but it's worth it. So, virgin, mother, or whatever breed of a streeling you might really be, just hear us. You can keep the pity. That was great. Thank you so much, Emer. <laughs> um, so if anyone has any questions for Emer, you can submit them through the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. Um, and just while they're coming in, I might ask you a few questions myself, Emer, if you don't mind. So you mentioned yeah. earlier in, in your presentation about history, culture and country um, closing in on a woman. Mm -hmm. And I'm interested if you think that as Irish women who've immigrated that we're carrying that history and culture with us as we move to different countries. And, and we, we have that with us all the time. 
I don't want to speak for every immigrant woman um, because I think immigration affects people differently. But for me, I've been here for eight years and certainly there are times when I recognize that as far as I believe that I've moved from my priest and incense drenched childhood, um, I still carry a huge amount of that religiously inscribed ethics and moral and a dogma with me. Um, and even though I've spent the majority of my adult life campaigning for abortion, like I still have to at times remind myself that abortion is something that's there for everyone. Like it's not just there for a, for a, a crisis pregnant, like for, for a, a situation in which you have no money or you, you know, there's, there's absolutely no way you can go forward. I think um, my emotional reaction to it is often different to my like intellectual reaction to it. Um, so yeah, I think a lot of that, I think a lot of that comes with you. I mean, to use a bit of, of, of gender theory, um, because that's what I do when I can't think of a, a good answer. I go to, I go to the theory, um, our gendered identities and religion is part, I think of many Irish women's gendered identities. Those are, those are built up in childhood and when they exist, um, they're part of you at a very fundamental level and they're incredibly difficult to change. Um, so I think what I'm doing in this piece is like, rather than just trying to ignore the Catholic upbringing that I had all together and the immense affection that I had for so many Catholic figures, such as the Virgin Mary, trying to actually account for it, you know? Um, and I think that might be a better way of moving through it as someone who's moved so far from Ireland than just trying to pretend that it didn't happen or it didn't exist. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, we do have a question here submitted by Patrick. So he's wondering if you could give the name of the one woman abortion story piece again. So I'm, I'm wondering if that's the Hush by Baby film maybe he's referring to. Tara Flynn. Okay. And she wrote a one person, Tara Flynn, T-A-R-A-F-L-Y-N-N. -A -N, and she wrote a one person um, musical uh, called Not a Funny Word, which was deeply touching, but also funny. Um, and it play, it was part, it was produced by This Is Pop Baby, which is also famous for producing a lot of Panty Bliss's um, uh, performances. Um, and it played in the Peacock in the Abbey Theatre. So it was the first play about abortion that played at the National Theatre. The only one actually. But an interesting thing about that piece too, I'm, I'm writing about it for, for my academic book, is that it was really hard for Tara. It's really like, it's a really excellent piece of theater and I'm an expert, <laughs> no, but it really is, a, you know, a phenomenal uh, performance. And Tara is a well-known and accomplished performer and she found it really hard in Ireland in 2017 to get it programmed. And a few times it was programmed and then canceled. Um, and I suppose it was just in advance of the referendum and maybe arts organizations didn't feel, um, didn't feel confident being partisan, but, I was I, I have been shocked really at how Irish theatre, which is a consider often considers itself quite a progressive mechanism, has been really loath to touch, um, was really loath to touch the uh, the the subject of abortion. Um, and Tara's piece was a was a, a brave and uh, and just aesthetically very enjoyable and a touching um, exception to that rule. Thank you. Oh, we, have, we have two more questions here. So, uh, fabulous talk, Emer. I, uh, I worked hard to campaign for the repeal of the 8th um, with AIMS Ireland. And like many, I felt exhausted, uh, drawn empty after the victory was won. How much do you think Irish feminism has changed since repeal? And even since all the churches have closed during COVID and the publication of the Mother and Baby Homes Report, any comments? Well, I'm going to have a very I'm going to I'm, I'm going to first of all empathize with that moment that post referendum moment where there was just the elation and joy of the day and then after just kind of this wow I'm exhausted and very conflicted feelings of like I didn't do enough I didn't do enough and also feeling part of this this um you know kind of acknowledging what we did give um 
and yeah, it was it was a real emotional roller coaster. So so many of us had campaigned for so many years, and that moment was the the culmination of of that work. Um, so afterwards, I think there was this exhaustion. I saw it in my friends. I certainly felt it. Where like anyone who wanted to talk about the referendum, I was like, no, that's it. I need like a month where I don't talk about abortion. Um, and but then I think from that, like that that kind of trough has a uh, has has given people time to regroup. And what I'm seeing now is just, you know, an immense energy directed at um, progressive social causes in Ireland. Something like um, the campaign to end direct provision. I feel like a lot of um, a lot of people who were behind repeal started saying, okay, now what can we now what can we change? And it looks like um, it, well, this government is committed to ending direct provision. And I feel like part of that is because that energy that was in the repeal campaign and that came in part from the marriage equality campaign before has kind of kept kept rolling. Um, and in terms of the reaction to mo the mother and baby's home reports. I'm just going to kind of refer you to what people from Plan and from the Adoption Rights Alliance have said, which is that when the McAleese report came out, which also treated um, survivors testimony horrendously and absolutely trampled on the human rights of the Magdalene survivors, nobody really cared. It was hard to get to, to get traction, to get media traction or social media traction on it. The, the, the people seem to swallow the, the, the reports and um, conclusions hook, line and sinker. And the church was absolutely exculpated and has refused to pay out those orders of nuns who refused to pay out to Magdalene survivors because they said that the report excul exculpated them. This time, it's very, very different. With the mother and baby homes report, it's like clan and, um, and the Adoption Rights Alliance and survivors and advocacy groups. It's like they have an army behind them. People really, really care um, and have been very vigilant about holding the, uh, the standard of the report um, uh, up to the light and uh, talking about its immense flaws and the immense flaws in how um, survivors were treated. So, so I'm, so I feel very positively that 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 energy from the eighth, although we were exhausted afterwards, that it didn't just disappear. That like people seem to have recognised that if they if they organise, we can really change because like it's kind of amazing what we did when you think. When you think of where this issue was, you know, when when I was in school, like in the in the nineties, like we we had a we had a, a an abortion debate in class in which there was no pro choice side. We were instead we were debating why it was wrong, um, and the and there was no voices like in the media, in the education system, the health. There was just there was you no know, there was a few lone voices, but they didn't have the kind of you know power and even right up until the end you know the two main parties only got on board at the very end when they saw the way that the pub that public opinion was going so so that knowledge that we changed that really closed ideological system and got people on board and we did it without support of the mainstream um media and politics i uh, that has just been you know i think that's really energized people and made them realize that there's if we want pro progressive change in our society, we can achieve it. Um, yeah. Yeah, the momentum is there and the activist skills have been learned and the techniques, yeah. yeah. Um, we have two more questions. So what are top issues for Irish feminists and would it always be overshadowed by religion? Hmm. Um, I don't think that at the moment we're, I think a lot of people would like to claim that we're, that we're past the point where, where um, Catholic identity and the power of the Catholic Church is is influencing um, Irish public life. I've I've just heard that so much that like we're a secular country now, and that's certainly not how I experience Ireland. And it's certainly not what the latest report into the mother and baby homes has shown. It's shown that concern for uh, for the church has immense power over the way that our histories are being drawn by state actors. Um, I do think that getting redress for um, victims. Uh, so, sorry, survivors and adopted people um, who uh, who have passed through Ireland's Magdalene laundries and mother and baby homes should be a major priority for us. And holding the church to account, um, direct provision has to end. Um, I think we need to seriously have a much more mature conversation in Ireland about sex work. At the moment, it's still I, it's so it's so rooted. In, um, in Catholic values. For example, the National Women's Council of Ireland who do some amazing work and who I've been an ambassador for in the past and who I'm, you know, I have a lot of affection and respect for, 
their their main um, uh, collaborators on the sex work issue are Ruhama and the Immigrant Culture, uh, the Immigrant Council of Ireland, who are both very enmeshed with the Catholic Church. They have nuns and um, and uh, and other religious members on their on their boards. And the Irish, the Immigrant Council of Ireland, was actually founded. You know, it's based in a religious order, one of the religious orders, in fact, that that ran the Magdalen laundries. So that conversation needs to move on. Um, what else? Uh, homelessness. Um, I know in some ways I'm just listing um, many, you know, of, of Ireland's most pressing social ills, but I do think they're feminist issues. You know, homelessness affects single mothers and families so much more now than it did before austerity and those, uh, those austerity measures that affect uh, women and families. Um, uh, they, they haven't been reversed now that we're ostensibly in recovery, right? They're just, that, that's the new normal. So, so yeah, those are just a few, and I'm sure you guys can think of more, but there's plenty of work to do. I don't think we should underestimate the influence of the Catholic Church in, in it still, but hopefully, I mean, the end game is that we reach a point where like we're fighting our feminist battles and we can ignore what Father Joe says. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, I have one here from Aideen. So she's writing from Frank Vancouver and she moved here in 1995 and was shocked and disappointed by how conservative the Catholic Church is here in Canada. Um, and it reminded her of the 50s in Ireland. So she wants to know what your thoughts of the Catholic Church are in Canada and across the different provinces. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I only know Quebec. Um, I haven't, I have, I'm sorry, I haven't been to Mass in all of the Canadian provinces, believe it or not, but I have been to Mass here in Quebec a few times. Um, I do think you're right that like immigrant communities or, you know, can tend to maintain the values of the country from the time they left, right? So there's a kind of, they're, they're, they're living a, a, a sometimes and not everyone, obviously, I'm not blanket talking about every Irish immigrant, but I think I've certainly noticed um, in the Irish community here that there can be a tendency towards a, a social conservatism that feels outdated in Ireland, right? That, that um, the version of Irishness that they're, that they're um, remembering and living and that forms part of their identities has changed at home. Um, and yeah, I mean, in my, in, my lim in my limited engagement with the Catholic Church here, I've certainly been disappointed by how um, divisive they are around the Francophone and Anglophone question. Like I went to a I went to a mass when I first got here to, the, to introduce the green season where the priest said, you know, when we arrived here in Quebec, we had our own language and we lost it. And uh, that's just, you know, and we, you don't hear us complaining to, to kind of attack um, language protection measures that, that, that Francophone Quebecers are taking to preserve their heritage and culture. And I felt very uncomfortable with it. I wondered what that was doing on a, on a Catholic pulpit. It's quite a conservative position, I think. Um, so yeah, I think I think well, honestly, I think that the Catholic Church is a force for immense conservative almost everywhere. Um, but yeah, it's it's Canada isn't immune. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I think we have time for just one more question. This is an interesting one. So someone is asking how you think the famine or the Great Hunger um, had anything to do with anti-women attitudes in Ireland, hmm. or if there's any correlation there whatsoever. Let's see. Around well, around reproduction, you can certainly you can certainly draw um, draw lines because um, the famine moves us towards um, a, a culture where you're supposed to get married later and have fewer children. That's the form of that's the form of contraception. So you end up with the situation because getting married young and having lots of children means you have to split the family land and leads to greater due to the penal laws um, and that uh, do I need to explain that about the penal laws? Under the penal laws, um, you Catholics who had children, who had sons, they had to divide their land between the sons instead of passing it down to one progenitor, um, to one descendant, sorry. Um, and that meant that over, over the years, your plots got smaller and smaller and people were impoverished. Absolutely ingenious way to impoverish an entire population. Okay, so the famine happens and afterwards you move to a culture of people getting married much later, um, you know, in their in their late twenties and thirties, and to many men not getting married at all, um, you know, as that being a kind of a, 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 a an appropriate um, form of contraception for the time, and then of course that leaves 
um, younger women who who have sex and get pregnant outside marriage, there's no longer the same societal pressure on them to the pressure on the men to marry them. So I do think there, which then creates a system where they need to be cleaned up somehow. They need to be put into some kind of architecture of containment, to use James M. Smith's words. So there's, so I think there are links. Um, yeah, I think there's certainly links, but of course it's not just as easy as the famine, therefore, um, uh, attitudes to female sexuality. Um, there's always kind of very multiple uh, causes feeding into to 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 a, a, a country's culture of gendered culture and um, uh, attitudes towards sexuality. Great, thank you so much. I think that's all we've time for. So, um, Ima, if you don't mind, I'm going to ask you to stop sharing your screen. And I just want to thank you once again for joining us. It's been an excellent presentation. Thank you so much for your time. Um, I mentioned at the start that today is our final of our eight events of the Bridget's Festival. And uh, we've been supported by the uh, Irish Consulate here in Vancouver that opened quite recently. So I'm just going to hand you over to Jennifer Burke, who is the Vice Consulate here in Vancouver. Thank you so much, Mary. And thank you to Emer. What an incredible presentation, very, very powerful. So as you will have heard at the beginning of this event, St. Bridget's Day celebrations started off in 2018 when the Department of Foreign Affairs chose St. Bridget's Day as a new way to showcase the work of trailblazing and inspirational women who are making their mark across a range of fields. The celebration has been going from strength to strength, both here in Vancouver and indeed around the world. President Michael D. Higgins in his special St. Bridget's Day message this year said, St. Bridget was a woman who rejected the conventions of her time, who dedicated herself to innovation in the realm of education, and who, in seeking to ensure that her voice was heard in a male-dominated world, had to summon an extraordinary courage, transcend obstacles, and not just survive, but put a new version of things in place. How appropriate then our invoking her is for our present circumstances. Today, as we recall her story with admiration, we may, all, may we also resolve to seek inspiration in her example, to pursue our ideal of equality, universal respect for rights, and a better word for all our citizens, male and female. I think these sentences perfectly encapsulate what we have seen here throughout the week of the 2021 Vancouver St. Bridget's Day Festival. From the hard hitting and liberating truths delivered to us by Alva Smith at the opening webinar last Sunday, to the beautiful and touching performances of Letters to the Diaspora, from Monica McWilliams' shocking and inspiring stories of hard-won change in Northern Ireland, to the success and strength of the professional women who spoke on women leading change for the Ireland Canada Chamber of Commerce, Vancouver. And of course, to today's powerful presentation from Dr. Ian O'Toole, and all of the other wonderful guests in between. We have seen and heard the creativity, the strength, the power, and the immense energy that Irish women bring to overcoming the challenges set before them and changing the world around them. And not least amongst these women is festival director Maura de Freitas. I really want to extend a huge thank you and congratulations to Maura who has worked tirelessly and passionately on this initiative. She's the driving force and the beating heart of this whole project. And after the incredible success of the 2020 Vancouver St. Bridget's Day Festival, which was in person, I have to admit I was a little bit nervous about how she was going to uh, meet the same standard because the bar was set so high last year. But she has shown that not only was she able to meet the same standard on a virtual platform, but actually surpass it. She's done an incredible job. So congratulations and thank you, Maura. And uh, next year you're going to be doing both in person and online, right? So no pressure or anything. <laughs> I also want to acknowledge the wonderful team who have been working with Maura, Aideen, Mary, Catherine, Catherine, Kate, Eilish, Breed, everyone else who's been involved in bringing this festival to life. They've been there every step of the way behind the scenes. And I know while everyone is very proud and happy that the festival has been such a success, there will be many sides of exhaustion and relief <laughs> and many well-deserved glasses of wine poured this evening. I also want to thank you, the viewers, for tuning in, for submitting your questions and feedback and supporting and enjoying the festival. The Consulate General of Ireland in Vancouver is very proud to support and participate in the Vancouver St. Bridget's Day Festival. Recalling, rec recalling President Higgins' words, 
through the stories of Bridget, we remember and we're aware that we as women have not always been allowed to use our voices. We've not always been allowed to celebrate our victories or our achievements. And we have had to overcome astonishing obstacles just to survive. The Vancouver St. Bridget's Day Festival creates a wonderful space where women, our survival, our accomplishments, our contributions can be publicly celebrated and appreciated. And I think most importantly, it's a space where Irish women can support, inspire and encourage each other to even greater heights and even bigger achievements. So with that, and I'd like to hand you over to you, Director Maura De Freitas. Maura, over to you. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Well, what an incredible week we've had. Um, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's been outstanding. And uh, I'd like to give, first of all, a huge thank you to Dr. Ingrid O'Toole for her outstanding performance today. Um, each uh, event was absolutely riveting and I've, I've enjoyed every single one. Really, it's been uh, my great honor uh, to act as festival director for our second annual St. Bridget's Day Festival here in Vancouver. Um, as many of you might know, we launched the first festival in collaboration with Simon Fraser University uh, last year, and it was a huge success. We were so blessed uh, last year as we just managed to slip through before all public events, particularly St. Patrick's Day, were closed down one after another. And that was what the start, that was the start of what we have all come to experience this past year with COVID-19. So <clears throat> this year with the pandemic, we were faced with a completely different situation. So we decided to innovate and created this uh, week-long event with some of the most remarkable and inspiring women we could present. And it has been such a joy and an absolute delight to welcome people from around the world. And I would like to thank all of you for attending. It is our hope to bring uh, the light of Bridget to people far and wide, and we're delighted with your response. I would particularly like to extend a huge thank you to Jennifer Burke, Vice Consul uh, here in Vancouver with the uh, Consulate General of Ireland. Her support has been absolutely invaluable. I would also be remiss if I didn't point out that none of this would have been possible without our amazing tech team, Mary McSweeney, Catherine Neal, Aideen Cleary, and Catherine McCooey. They have been the angels working their magic behind the scenes. And finally, <clears throat> I'd like to bring your attention to this magnificent piece of artwork behind me. And many of you would have noticed this painting in our promo material in the lead up to the festival. So I would like to acknowledge and thank the talented Irish Canadian artists behind it. My friend, Deirdre Cohen. Uh, you can read more about everyone who participated in this week's events on our website, uh, BridgetFestivalVancouver.com. And in closing, I wanted to say thank you to everyone. We will be in contact. Watch our websites for updates as all our sessions will be posted on YouTube later this week. And we hope to see you all again next week. Goodbye for now. Thank you.